Welcome online church. We are ready to worship together this morning. And as we begin, I'm going to ask that you just be able to lay all your burdens aside. We're going to start with prayer. During the worship time, I'm going to put up a connect card button and a give button. And the connect card is just so that we know that you're here and if you have any prayer requests. And give is just part of the act of worship. As we flow through worship, we are given everything and we just give back a poor, small portion back to him and he multiplies it in many ways for the gospel to go forward. So please join me in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you that once again we get to worship you. We get to worship you with our time, with our lips and music, with our heart and mind as we receive the word, with our time of finances, Father. I just ask that as we gather, you will continue to do works in our hearts and minds to continue to just bring you glory, Father. And Father, as we worship you in song, we know that praising you lifts our eyes unto the hills, lift our eyes up unto you, and meet us here today in powerful ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Jesus is a refuge, a shelter from the storm, a help to those who call. The name of Jesus is a fortress, a saving place to run, a hope unshakable. When we fall, you are the Savior. You are the answer, there is power in your name, there is power in your name. In the name of Jesus, there's life and healing, chains are broken in your name. Every knee will bow down and our hearts will
through the word. Pastor Tim will bring us the message. Hey, good morning online church. Uh, it is good to be with you this week. Hope you are having a good week and hope you have been processing things through Lent as we prepare to meet the risen Christ at Easter. We've been talking through this whole series about what it means to surrender your life to God. We took some time talking about surrendering your hope of being able to save yourself. We talked about surrendering your will to God's will. We contrasted and looked at, well, what does that look like for different people? Today, I want to talk about um, surrendering something you may not think about when you think about things you need to surrender to God. But we want to talk about surrendering your relationships. It's an interesting concept. What does it look like to have relationships that are surrendered to God? Of course, you could go immediately and look at verses like, by this wall, people know you're my disciples, that you love one another. Or we could talk about loving your enemies and praying for the people who persecute you. We could talk about washing each other's feet. And all of those are a part of surrendered relationships, certainly. But the angle I want to come at this from is the uh, angle of Romans 12, 18. Here's what it says. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's important to know that this verse comes at the end of a very long list of instructions on how Christians are to treat each other. This is, of course, not the only list like that in the New Testament, but it does give you a reasonable outline of how to engage in relationships. And it also points to the inner attitudes that are going to be necessary to bring those relationships about. To me, 
uh, Paul, in the midst of giving instructions, gives two summary verses in this section. One of those is verse 15, and the other is verse 18. Verse 18, well, actually, let me do this. Let me read the whole section, and I want you, while I'm reading this, to be thinking about relationships as you listen to what it is that Paul's saying. And then I've highlighted for you the two summation verses so you can kind of get the idea. Here's what he says. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what's good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. I think that's one of the summary verses. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. That's Romans 12, 9 through 19. Again, my own interpretation is that when Paul says rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, that he's giving a a summary. Be with people, be in it with people. It's a sign of maturity to be able to get out of yourself and to be able to be present with other people where they are. And then verse 18, and this is where I want to spend the rest of this conversation this morning. Verse 18 says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He's summing up what he has just been saying to the Romans and through them to us. From a big picture point of view, I could make a really strong argument that the Bible is primarily written in the language of relationships. So much of what the scripture talks about, about life and how it relates to us, how how we relate to God, how we relate to each other, is all in the language of relationships. God is our Father. We are all brothers and sisters. Love one another as I have loved you. So much is in, again, this language of relationships. I came as a shepherd to, you know, it's all this relationship stuff. So relationships surrendered to God, they're going to have this certain foundational character to them. They're going to have this framework of attitude and action in which they are to exist and to thrive. It's this Christian ethic, if you want, around our relationships. So let's look at one small part, but a very practical piece of this process of surrendering your relationships to God. In verse 18, in what I said was the summation verse, It says, live at peace with everyone. Hey, what a wonderful goal. And what a really great place to start with our discussion of surrendered relationships. So let's start there. If we were to look at all of the relationships in our lives, if you were to look at all of the relationships in your life, it would be reasonable to ask the question, Are you at peace or do you have peace with the people in your life? In other words, peace with those around you will be one of the criteria you can use to determine 
if you're surrendering your relationship to God. Are you at peace, content? So a little honest inquiry will do you some good. Are you in a continued conflicted state with anybody? What's interesting is as you begin to look at this issue in yourself, is that question, am I in a continued uh, condition of conflict with anyone, that has two really different but potential feeder streams into the river of conflict in your life. Those feeder streams are one with individuals and the other is with groups of people. For example, in the individual category, let's say that neighbor who got themselves elected to the HOA board and now has little better to do than walk around the neighborhood twice a day with a clipboard looking for violations, maybe you feel conflict towards that person. How about the crazy left-wing rainbow flag flying transgender rights advocate who can't seem to talk about anything else ever who lives on one side of you? Or the crazy right-wing magna Trump is the Messiah sent from heaven to save our country and our guns who lives on the other side of you? Maybe you're in conflict with them. How about the estrangements in your circles? How about the continuing power struggles that you might be having? How about the unresolved hurt or trauma or strained relationships, even with the people you should be closest to? Spouses, parents, children, grandchildren, in-laws, close friends. That's the individual side. And it can take a lot of different forms. In the group category, we certainly seem to have this capacity as a race of lumping people together, this tribalism thing. And often those lumping together, it's unfair. And we can develop relational issues with whole groups of people. So, for example, maybe you have a problem and, well, since it's an election year, maybe you have a problem with Democrats. Or maybe you have a problem with Republicans or progressives or conservatives or maybe politicians or bureaucrats in general. Maybe for you it's Catholics or Muslims or Jews or maybe it's blacks or undocumented Latino immigrants, or Asians. Maybe it's people on welfare. Maybe it's drug addicts. Maybe it's the working poor. How about lazy people? Or maybe you go the other way and you have a problem with affluent people and what you deem their excesses. Or maybe you have a problem with people who thought up all these categories. How about entitled people? Rude people, selfish people, gossips, or maybe it's just the apparently endless supply of slow drivers in the left lane on 41. You get the idea. My intention isn't to make any kind of statement on any of these groups or peoples or ideas or concepts. Honestly, if you're listening to me and you're offended or angry that I would bring, even bring up any of these things, that might be an indication you have some work to do here. The heart of tribalism and prejudice and us and them thinking is centered in conflict in some way or another with us. We see them as other, as someone to be feared or someone who's trying to take what we have. There's some conflict. So it might be helpful to take an inventory of where you are in your attitude towards those kinds of relationships. And both individually and in groups of people in your life. 
are you at peace? If there's a continuing conflict that's not in the active process of being resolved, then again, you most likely have some work to do. Now, before you get too hard on yourselves, if you're not perfectly at peace with every one of your relationships, it would help you to remember that because of the nature of relationships, by necessity involving more than one person, Paul gives us this qualifier. For as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you. Because, let's face it, I can want peace in my relationships, but I can't control the other people in the equation of relationships and how they react. I can no more force someone to be at peace with me than I could reverse the aging process or prevent my own death. As much as it depends on you is another way of saying of what we know to be true, but often wish it wasn't. And that is you can only control yourself. I really like the language the recovery community gives us when it comes to this controlling yourself and making amends and fixing and being at peace in the conflicts in our lives. They talk about it as the process of owning our side of the street, keeping our side of the street clean. That's all you're responsible for. Keep your side of the street clean. I believe I have this right when I say that the way AA talks about seeking reconciliation through making amends is how someone receives your attempts at amends is none of your business because it's not your responsibility. In other words, I own my part. I do what I have to do to try to make our relationship right. And then I surrender the rest up to God. I own my part, which is what it means for as much as it depends on me, as much as it depends on you. I have to own my part. When I'm wrong, I have to admit it and ask for forgiveness. And I have to try to make it right. I have to try to make amends. I have to come and I have to say, this is what I did and I'm sorry. When I'm hurt or I'm injured, I also have to admit that. And I have to bring it to the other person and tell them how it affected me so we can be reconciled. Jesus said both things. Listen, if someone is offended by you, you need to go to them. If you've offended them, you need to go to them. But if you're holding something against someone else, you need to go to them. And so it's both ways. We don't get, well, they hurt me. They should come to me. It's both sides. That's as much as it depends on me. And here's where the other qualifier that Paul gives us to as much as it depends on you comes in. He qualifies even that. Here's what he says. If it's possible. If it's possible as far as it depends on you live at peace with everyone. Because you're in relationship with other people who you can't control, it may sometimes not be possible to have a peaceful relationship with them because they won't have it. You can ask forgiveness and they won't forgive you. You can seek to be reconciled and they want to stay mad. They want to hold a grudge. You can want to restore trust, but they refuse to trust you. Or you can go and you can say, listen, when this happened, I was really hurt. And they won't take any responsibility for it. They blame you. Or you can tell them the truth and they can call you a liar. And let's be honest, it's easy for us to blame others, including their reaction to us and our reaction to them in conflict. Think about it. 
How many of you have ever said in your mind something along the lines of, if they wouldn't be this way, then I wouldn't be that way. If my wife wasn't a nag, or my husband was more attentive, or my kids were more motivated, or my boss wasn't a jerk, I wouldn't act like this. We blame others for our response. We give them power. That's not keeping our side of the street clean. Surrendered relationships is coming to an understanding that all you can do is own your part. That's all you can do. Do what you have to do to make it right and then surrender the rest up to God and be free as much as it depends on me. Lest you think this isn't a big deal, this concept of reconciled and right relationships isn't a big deal, I want to remind you of what Jesus said in Matthew 6. And again in Matthew 18, the same concept is repeated, and actually it's repeated multiple places in multiple ways. In Matthew 6, Jesus, it's the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's teaching them the Lord's Prayer, something you should know. Here's, he, here's what he says. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, and we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Did you catch those last verses? Of all the concepts that Jesus loads into the Lord's Prayer, God's glory, his kingdom coming, our daily bread, the fight against temptation. The one Jesus emphasized was forgiveness and surrendered relationships. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. If you don't surrender your relationships, you're dooming yourself. So, follower of Jesus, for as much as it depends on you, as much as it depends on you, keep your side of the relationship street clean. How the people across the street choose to live is really none of your business and you can't control it. If there's forgiveness work you need to do on your side of the street, do it. Do it until you don't have to forgive anymore. And there's no way with the amount of people who will watch this, there is no way that some of you have not been deeply, deeply wounded. Forgive until you don't have to forgive anymore. If there are amends that you have to make, if there are things that you've done to others, you take the initiative. Even if it's really uncomfortable, even if it makes you feel vulnerable, even if it makes you feel like you're failing in some way, you take the initiative to seek forgiveness and reconciliation as much as it depends on you. How they respond is ultimately none of your business. Ask the Holy Spirit to come. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to see yourself clearly in these matters. For as much as it depends on you, surrender your relationships and be at peace. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. There's work to do there. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it's messy work. Sometimes it's painful work. But ultimately, 
we can be free of what's the saying, renting out space in our heads to other people, of allowing other people to control how we respond and where we go in our heads. Ultimately, we can be at peace. And we can come to the place of whether the relationship is at a distance, whether it's close, whether you have to put up boundaries to stay healthy, whatever that looks like, that you can be at peace in that relationship. That's part of how God is about changing us and working through us and cleaning us up. And so I just recommend to you, as you're reading in the scripture yourself, to be listening and looking for these, these uh, clues, these hints, these instructions on relationships and begin to apply them to yourself. Begin to ask the question, what's my part? And that's a great question. One of the questions I always ask people uh, if they come to me, they want to be remarried after they've been divorced, is what was your part in the previous relationship? How have you grown? How do you see yourself differently? What's going to be different this time? It's the same thing in all of our struggles with relationships. What's my part? How can I grow? How can I see myself differently? How can I do this better and more like Jesus? Think about it and let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, thank you that so much of our relational um, stuff is so important to you. You talk about it all the time. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us. For those of us who have work to do uh, in our relationships, I pray that you would help us do it. For those of you who, um, or for those of us who are struggling right now, I pray that you would just give us some clarity. Father, for those of us who have gotten into bad habits of blaming others, of holding on to prejudices, of seeing the world in us and them terms, of giving into fear, I pray that you would break those strongholds in us and set us free as we surrender our relationships and that side of our life to you. We don't just want to have a good relationship with you, Lord. We want to have a good relationship with those around us. Whatever that means, help us to do it in healthy ways. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I hope you have a really wonderful week. Again, as we're getting closer and closer to Easter and the wonderful story of resurrection. Have a great week. So this week, according to Psalm 25, it says, Make me known thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. For thee I will wait all the day. As we continue in the surrendered life, may he lay the path and show you the week that you will have as you continue to surrender to him. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.